Good afternoon. You know we're going to have to try that again. It's always hard to break into conversations, especially conversations among friends who may not have seen one another for quite a while. Thank you all for coming. We're going to start one more time. Dr. Rabowski is here. We've been well rehearsed. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. <laughs> Welcome. Welcome to the second annual Wisdom Institute luncheon. As you know, the Wisdom Institute is UMBC's young association for all university retirees, both faculty and staff. Since our inception, we have sponsored many events and programs. We've partnered with colleagues still actively employed on campus, as well as with persons in the broader community. Together, we have offered many opportunities. I'll highlight just a few. We have monthly informal luncheons in the skylight. We take meditation walks with the wellness program that's offered by HR. We've sponsored a bus trip to the American, African American Museum and Heritage Museum. I'm not nervous, am I? We've taken a bus trip to the African American Heritage Museum in Washington, DC in partnership with the Arbutus community. We've held a pre-retirement dialogue with the Erickson School focused on questions that are outside the information that HR will give. Members have engaged in community service both on and off campus. I talked to one of our leaders today who actually helped prepare an interview, do a mock interview for our most recent uh, prestigious scholar honoree, a Truman. So last year we were able to talk about a Rhodes. This year we have a new Truman, which is really, really exciting. Staff members have come back to work in departments to help with faculty with grants or to step in when administrative assistants are on leave. I could go on, I really could go on, and I hope many of you have been involved in some of these programs. But instead, I'm going to ask you to visit our website periodically and see what might be of interest to you. If you don't see what you're looking for, let us know. We'll do our best to see that it happens. And more than likely, we're going to strong arm you into leading the effort. So no good deed goes unpunished. But we, we invite everyone to come and be even more involved with the Wisdom Institute. Such opportunities to engage, have fun, and continue to serve don't just happen in a vacuum. There's a group of dedicated, creative, and energetic individuals who truly work selflessly to make sure that all of this is possible. And those are the members of our Wisdom Institute board. Would board members please stand and be recognized, and, and let's thank them together. And Larry Wilt and Sandy Parker were not able to be here today. Um, special thanks to our programming committee, raise your hands, who with the unending support of Diana Smith um, planned this very special day from soup to nuts or maybe I should say from hors d'oeuvres to dessert. As you can see, our board is comprised of a most amazing group of people, and I'm honored to work with each and every one of them. And I'm not alone, however, in recognizing their achievements and creativity. The National Association of Retirement Organizations in Higher Education, well known as AROHI, has twice spotlighted Wisdom Institute efforts in their newsletter, and in our very first year of existence, we were nominated for an innovation award, um, even though we had not been a year old. It's really quite something. I want to note that the Wisdom Institute is indebted to our president and our provost, Dr. Rabowski and Dr. Rouse, both of whom have lent their full support, and I do mean full support, to our efforts. Indeed, they are our hosts for today. And the reason there are absolutely no fees associated with our gathering today is because they have extended full payment so that we could meet together. <laughs> Dr. Rouse extends his sincere regrets. He was not able to join us today. He had planned to do so, and in fact, he was scheduled to give these welcoming remarks. Um, but he was called away at the very last moment. But please know he is with us in spirit. A moment for reflection. When I first came here, and it sounds so long ago, but back in 1987, as a visiting assistant professor, the campus looked nothing like it does today. 
The boxy red brick buildings were predominant. The built environment was cold. It was almost sterile. And I almost expected to see guards walking back and forth the breezeways. In terms of the natural environment, there were a few trees scattered about. And those trees served as homes for some of the strangest squirrels I have ever seen. I hear that you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> But it wasn't too many years after I came on campus that things began to change. I commented to many colleagues that the campus was really beginning to look different. Trees, bushes, shrubs, flowers, they were all being planted in great numbers everywhere on campus. I asked, how, how, how did this happen? And I was told, and forgive me for telling your story, but I was told that Dr. Rabowski had just assumed a leadership position in the administration and he had made beautifying the campus and sustainability a top priority. Back then, I was told, Dr. Rabowski, that you walked around the campus, and I've seen you do this before for other reasons, and pointed to whole corridors and spaces where things could be planted, and the campus could be beautified, and things could be improved. We thank you. I have to say that the landscape today is absolutely gorgeous, and I hope you felt as I did coming on campus. I think it looks wonderful, and spring is here in all its glory. <laughs> Dr. Rabowski Freeman, as we know you and love you, acknowledge the importance of beauty in the natural environment as necessary as a necessary context, indeed, for his vision of inclusivity and educational excellence. This orientation, coupled with his deep ethic of care and profound sense of responsibility, has served as a foundation for our reputation as an honors university that welcomes and fosters inquiring minds. Freeman, we are both grateful and proud. Thank you. Thank you. Again, welcome, thank you all for coming, and it's my distinct pleasure to invite Dr. Rabowski to the podium. Thank you. Could you all give Diane a round of applause? We've been recognized by the Association of Retirement um, Organizations in Higher Education, and she is our representative, and they've twice now recognized us for what we're doing. So, Diane, thank you again. Give her another round of applause, would you please? So I've told several of you that I have a, a new book with, 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 with Philip and Peter in my office coming out with Hopkins Press entitled the, uh, the Empowered University. But then it says, as a semicolon after it, and it says, Shared Leadership, Culture Change, and Academic Success. And, and I draw heavily on that wonderful book that I know everybody's read of George the News by this point. Uh, if you haven't, you really should read it, on our history, on the policies here in the state and beyond on this 50-year experiment that we've been a part of. The first sentence in the book, and it's written in my voice, says, it's not about me. Because often when presidents write these books, it ends up sounding like something that they did. And so, Diane, when you were talking, yeah, I did get really excited about the appearance, the aesthetics, the environmental issues from Syria and everything else. But I want to give a very outspoken person all the credit. Would you all <laughs> applaud Pat Lanou, please? She was amazing. I was, in the academy, we're supposed to tell the truth. And while I might have had some slight idea about the possibilities, she didn't just say, we've got to do much better. She brought me photos from campuses. Do you see this? Do you see this? We could do this. We could do this. And it was the best definition of pushy I've ever seen. Because, <laughs> because it wasn't pushy about something for herself. It was about for all of us. And so what you see here is a result of what she did, Sandy Parker, so many other people who were involved. And, and so it's important to tell that. I just came from um, a, a seminar this morning by our what we call CS3, which is the Center for Social Science Research, and Christine Mallinson on immigration and mobility in higher education. And several people spoke about issues involving tuition uh, and in-state tuition, but a fascinating conversation that led to the, the discussion by George Lanou, who said he had to get over here. But it was significant to hear him talking about the big questions that we have to ask, including the fact that when he and Pat were in Canada recently, the, the people seemed to discourage them from wanting to immigrate, to migrate there. It was very interesting, as welcoming as they are, and the kinds of questions one asks about health policies. And I thought about that as I was looking at Evan Avia, 
If you look up that name, A-V-I-L-A, um, and he is uh, the new Truman Scholar, the son of immigrants, and he is Latino. Uh, he is um, an economics major, an amazing young man, but he won the special national policy competition on major proposals for rethinking retirement of the millennials, particularly, particularly those in the gig economy, those who have not had opportunities for formal retirement benefits. And, and out of the country, literally, he won first place and wants to do that work, wants to think about uh, retirement issues for people coming from other countries or people in this country who have not had the benefit of a steady retirement kind of approach of what should our country be doing. So it's, it's a big deal. By the way, I have asked Philip if I can say this. Philip's daughter has been in intensive care for weeks. And I ask you, if you have faith, to pray for them. If not, just to give them your thoughts. And if you, if you are close enough to just say, we're thinking about you, Philip, you, you know it's really challenging when a parent is dealing with something like that. She had been a PhD student at the University of Pennsylvania and it is a very serious matter. And so I have said to him, Philip, when you need to call in or whatever, but family comes first, and please take the time and be with your daughter. So let's just keep our thoughts and prayers with him. The other major point I wanted to make is this, that Tom, we're delighted you're here. Tom Horton, we're really delighted you're here. The, uh, I appreciate that. Good friend. And uh, when I think about you and I think about Will Baker, or I think about Mike Bowler, I mean, some of us who know each other, it's just as I walk from table to table, I kept having memories about different people from different times, all the way back, all the way to Karen, to Betty, to uh, just look around the room and you see folks. I told Betty Glasgow she's reversing the aging process somehow, <laughs> and she gets upset when I say things like that. But the fact is that all of you look so, Susan, uh, uh, people I see here, and the point is this, everybody has a story. Each of you can tell me stories about when you were talking about the foundation for the things involving computer science. I mean, it's, it's very, we appreciate it. So today is a chance to celebrate the foundation of UMBC. Anybody who was here in the first 50 years, I call the founders of this place. We've laid the foundation. That just think about it. And if we are doing well, and we really are, um, it is because of all the work and effort of so many of you over the years in faculty and staff in supporting this place. It has been an honor to be here. And we are now 50, what are we, 50, 53 years old. So we're still babies in higher education. And yet, the newest survey that was talked about today by David Di Maria, the new the international person uh, for the campus, um, um, said this, that in the Times, it is the um, Times Higher Education Survey. Uh, the fact is that uh, we are about number 62 out of 400 and some campuses worldwide in sustainability uh, development goals. It's called, the, uh, and, and it, it's called SDG. And these are the goals set by the United Nations for universities, for companies, and others. But number 60 something out of 400. But what he also said was, in America, the list for those that are making the most progress, and this is involving everything from social inequality, gender and racial inequality, the environment, uh, that we are, there's Chapel Hill is number one, Arizona State is number two. UMBC is number three in America. Give us a big round of applause for that. So it's, it's most appropriate. And, and with that said, what that says to me is two things. One, it's great to be doing better than a lot of places. But two, there's a lot of work to do. That, and that's why I think it's great that the Wisdom Institute today is focused on these environmental matters from great journalists, somebody who's an expert on the Chesapeake Bay, somebody who's a part of a sister institution, Salisbury, we're delighted. I'm going to send a note. The chancellor's always talking about systemness. Well, this is, I hate that word, but systemness, right? But it's good to see the collaboration across campuses in that way. And, and then, finally, we were cooking all night. Enjoy the food. Thank you. All right, all right. Enjoy. <laughs>
And something on the environment came up many, many times. And then we brought it down to the Chesapeake Bay, and we are just delighted that our first choice, Tom Horton, uh, accepted our invitation. And on behalf of the planning committee, those of you, you raised your hand before, but uh, Sandy Parker isn't here, Leslie Morgan, Brian McKay, Joyce Tenney, and who did I forget? Um, we really have thought a lot about you, Tom. And we've received a lot of uh, accolades about Tom when we say, oh, Tom Horton's going to be our speaker. We hear, oh, great. He's a wonderful raconteur. <laughs> Sorry, can't get too close. He's, an, uh, as you know, a naturalist, uh, an author, an award-winning author. Did, how many of you saw some of his books and Brian McKay's books as you came in? And they are going to be out there, I think, after our luncheon, if you didn't get a chance to uh, see them and purchase them before you can. Uh, he's an outdoorsman. He's a filmmaker. And he's knowledgeable, but beyond knowledgeable, reflective. And it's Tom's reflectiveness and his ability to pull disparate parts together to assimilate things and give us new insight and meaning that I think is especially important for what he's going to talk to you about today. He's been recognized as one of the nation's foremost nature writers, as I said, in several books. Um, and he's also written articles and been published in the National Geographic, the Smithsonian, the New York Times, the Rolling Stones, and the Baltimore Sun. And in fact, it, it was through the Baltimore Sun years and years ago that uh, I first was introduced to Tom and read his columns regularly. In 13 years, how many columns do you think he wrote? Over 600. So he's really prolific. Um, I have a copy of the last column that you wrote in 2005. And if some of you would like to see it, I made extra copies. Uh, and, and he was quite wise in 2005 in what he wrote and has continued to share with us. He's developed a passion, I think, uh, for the Chesapeake Bay, the watershed, environmental issues, in part, he says, because of growing up on the Eastern Shore, where he was born and lived in small towns on the Eastern Shore um, for, he recollects, what'd you say, two-thirds of your life. Uh, but he did get around. He's seen a lot of the world. Um, First started at, in Baltimore here, he went to Hopkins and had a degree, re received a degree in biology and economics. And then he decided to venture out a little further. And in the early 70s, he became an Arabic translator for the Army Security Agency. And he went to Ethiopia, North Yemen, Sudan, Saudi Arabia, and the Persian Gulf. A uh, little different landscape than the Eastern Shore, for sure. <laughs> uh, currently, he's taken on a couple additional uh, career goals. He's um, continuing to write, and he's a regular columnist for the Bay Journal. And you all have on your table somewhere a green half sheet two-sided, you'll notice, and on one side you have a survey you can take, and on the other side um, are some links to places that you may want to check out to either read on a regular basis or volunteer or get involved with. But the top on the list is the Bay Journal, and you can uh, subscribe to the Bay Journal online free and read what Tom is writing now uh, on a regular basis, and I'm sure they'd be happy for contributions as well. Right, Tom? Oh. Tom's also uh, written, in addition to the books, the award-winning books, he's begun a career in filmmaking. 
And um, I think you've done four, or you're about to start your fourth. The fourth. And he's, he told me it's a documentary about a little-known community on the eastern shore called San Domingo. Anybody heard of San Domingo? Well, you'll get to know about San Domingo when he finishes this documentary. It was founded in 1820 by free blacks from Haiti and the Dominican Republic. So um, good luck to you on that film, and we'll, we'll look forward to watching it. He's also an educator, and he's, he's been an educator all along, I think, when you lead tours, when you write, when you talk to people, as he's done, you're teaching all the time. But he has this title now of Professor of Practice, as Dr. Rabowski said, at Salisbury. And he teaches writing and environmental courses. But the course that I'm most excited about is his summer course. And he takes students for a month camping and kayaking throughout the Chesapeake Bay and the tributaries. So all throughout this month, in addition to paddling and uh, sleeping in the ground, they are meeting with artists and scientists and naturalists and watermen. And Tom's contacts throughout the watershed are enormous. And I'm sure those conversations are really uh, very beneficial both to the artists and scientists and to the students as well, of course. Uh, when they come back after this month, they have a week to assimilate their learning and to uh, prepare for a final presentation. And Tom, I'd love to come to this year's final presentation. I think it would be... Uh, well, you let us know. We'll, we'll put it on the Wisdom Institute uh, website. Now, I haven't mentioned lobbying as one of the things that uh, Tom might have done. So when I asked him, do you, you know, he's passionate about several of these issues, these policy issues. I said, have you ever lobbied? And he said, well, Patricia, I'd like to, but, you know, journalists just don't lobby. However, I had one exception. And this exception, he said, he occurred uh, back in 2008 when he was a member of a team that put together an effort to have the Smith Island layer cake become the official dessert of Maryland. <laughs> and guess what? The bill passed. <laughs> so... <laughs> uh, I'm sorry that we don't have that Smith Island layer cake for dessert this year, but maybe, Diana, we ought to put it on the menu for next year. Uh, but the nice thing about Tom, and there are many wonderful things about Tom, is he said he was glad for how it helped the economy of some of the women because it's become a very popular thing to have the Smith Island cake. And, and that's what Tom is like. He cares about these other people. We have the pleasure of listening to Tom for about a half an hour, and then he will open it up to questions and answers. So uh, I am delighted to turn the podium over to you, Tom. Thank you, Patricia. Uh, he has a way of making you sound more interesting than you really are. Uh, I got to tell you, this is not going to be as exciting as the last talk I gave with Freeman in the audience. Uh, it was several years ago. I was following a woman speaker who did not share my views. Uh, this guy sits in the back after I'm finished and shouts out, one of you has got to be lying, <laughs> at which point at which point I said, well, it's her. At which point her husband, a pretty good-sized old boy standing in the back of the room, invited me to step outside. <laughs> At which point my co-panelists from the Sierra Club and the Nature Conservancy were diving for the exits. But, but you know, it was the right damn question to ask, and, and no one else had the guts to do it. So, so anyway, this will be a, a calmer, more collaborative experience, I hope, than that. And, and she was lying, but uh, anyway. So, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a heavy thing to 
address something called the Wisdom Institute, and I, I've given it a little thought. You know, one of the wisest people I knew was my late friend Tom Wisner. Tom was a total creative genius. Uh, his song, Chesapeake Born, has become kind of an anthem of the Chesapeake. He was a sculptor, dancer, singer, a storyteller, folklorist, uh, brought all of those talents to bear on childhood uh, environmental education. And uh, I spent a lot of time in hospice when Tom was dying. Uh, he was a huge inspiration and a mentor to me. And I I promised I would not do something this trite, but toward the end I said, Tom, if you had to sum it all up, you know, what would you say? And knowing that's impossible. And he, he just said, we're here to learn. And I, you know, I expect uh, you people in this room have figured that out a long time ago. The only thing I think I give my students that might pass for wisdom is I tell them, uh, if you're gonna get into any of these save the world uh, professions, whether it's beating weapons into plowshares, ending AIDS in Africa, peace in our time, social justice, saving the planet, you gotta figure ways to build in reward and pleasure and fun or you're gonna burn out because I have seen that. And I, I really think that's true because, you know, when you set out to save the world, whatever aspect of it you may choose, you, you're going to lose. And some days, believe it or not, the world isn't going to seem grateful. So uh, you really need to do that. Uh, one caveat about my wisdom. This is a book I published first in 1991, sort of the closest thing you can get to a textbook on Chesapeake Bay. I published this edition in 2003. Uh, at the time, I would say it represented the accumulated scientific and environmental wisdom of not only me, but anybody I could talk to around the Chesapeake who would be wise about it. Uh, I'm going to do a third edition, and I reread this. This book has two paragraphs not strung together on climate change, which 16 years later, would you wouldn't even think about it. Half the book's going to be climate change now. So in 2003, uh, we who thought we were wise do not seem so wise. And you know, arguably, that is going to, everything I'm going to tell you today could change quite a bit uh, if we don't get more serious about climate change. So I want to explain the Bay to you a little bit. And uh, I got some slides here, and I may need some help pulling them up. There's just three of them that will give a little context for understanding what I'm talking about. Oh, the insight about building some fun in was said much better by E.B. White, an essayist back in the 50s. Uh, he said something like, every morning I get up torn between whether to lament all that's wrong with the world or to just go out and enjoy it. And you have to do some of both, but uh, he was pretty good. He worried about nuclear war back in the 50s and 60s. Well, let's see what I can do. Yeah, uh, I have a thumb drive here called SU for Salisbury University. It's, and I just need to pull that up in Finder. Yeah, that's it. Okay, we got it. Yeah. There's three slides here that will give a little context. This is a nice raven map. It's the physiographic US, just the, the features, the rivers, the mountains. If you start up there in Puget Sound at the corner, run around down the California coast to cross through Texas where the Mexicans are busy building the Great Wall, even as we speak, down, down along the Gulf Coast, you can see the Mississippi come out in that big jumbly delta down there. Florida Bay, on around the coast, you get up to the Chesapeake and whoa, there's nothing like that as far as an incursion of the oceans into the landscape. 
uh, just in case you don't see it. That's us. 187 miles the ocean extends into the land from Norfolk to Haver de Grace. If you tease out all of that tidal shoreline, you end up with, according to the Virginia Institute of Marine Science this year, 11,628 miles of land water edge. There is really nothing like that anywhere else on the American coastline, and it explains a lot about why so much of our culture and history, our heritage, our livelihoods are linked to the Chesapeake and its tidal rivers. Uh, it's really quite unique. And all that edge is not just a cocktail party trivia question because so much of nature and so many humans all want waterfront real estate. And I'll talk about that a little later. So. We talked about the big picture. This is narrowing it down a little bit. This is the operative unit for all our efforts to restore the bay. It's the watershed, the drainage basin, 40 odd significant rivers run down into the main bay, meet the salt tides from the ocean coming up. Uh, it's a big piece of, piece of land. It's 64,000 square miles, 48 million acres. Up the top there is the Baseball Hall of Fame, Cooperstown, New York. I take partial credit for a sign that's right outside the Baseball Hall of Fame that says something like the Chesapeake Bay starts here. They didn't know till I came up there doing a National Geographic article and told them. They said, oh, that's kind of cool. So uh, goes out into Altoona, Pennsylvania, down on that southwestern corner to Lynchburg, Virginia. It's about a sixth of the East Coast. Uh, between uh, Vermont is a little north, North Carolina is a little bit south. And it all drains into a body of water that looks pretty big when you cross the Bay Bridge or the bridge tunnel down at the mouth, but it's only about 1 16th the area of the land. But more than that, the Bay is kind of an illusion. It looks big, but there ain't much water in it. It's about, if you went from Haver de Grace to Norfolk, you'd have about a million feet. If you went down to the widest part there in Virginia, about 100,000 feet. Depth average about 21 feet. Try and model that sometime, uh, a million by 100,000 by 21. It's, the water gets pretty thin on any scale you'd care to model it. So the implications of that for having to attend to good land uses as opposed to polluting land uses on that massive watershed are huge. Very, very few coastal water bodies anywhere on earth have that much land draining into that little water. And of course you got some help from the ocean which flushes it daily with tides four times a day, but uh, it's pretty weak flushing. The tides on the bay are just a couple feet. They're nothing like these big coastal tides. So you really have to watch that. Just one other slide here. I'm doing better than I usually do with technology. I still write in DOS, which I think most of you can. Thank God Sony makes floppy drives that plug into USB ports. This is something most people, even EPA, didn't pay attention to. That gray area, far bigger than the Bay Watershed, is the Bay Airshed. Uh, about a third of the pollutants we worry about most in Chesapeake Bay come from dirty air. The Clean Air Act is darn near as important as the Clean Water Act in restoring places like Chesapeake Bay. It's mainly nitrates, nitrogen oxides from burning fossil fuels, uh, from the Ohio River Valley, from as far a little bit into Ontario, I think. So uh, very few people are uh, aware of how important the airshed is to restoring the bay and why we really have to politically, it gets very interesting, and Maryland is part of a lot of regional 
greenhouse gas, clean air compacts, which try to make some inroads into this. But coal burning power plants in the Ohio River Valley are pretty deadly to the bay. So that's kind of the context I'll be talking in. Okay, we can uh, get back to just, just talking a little bit now. Uh, an old guy named Don Pritchard, who was a, a, a pioneer oceanographer at Johns Hopkins, used to say in his classes when I was an undergraduate at Hopkins, we are very fortunate people. We live in the age of estuaries. What he meant, an estuary of which the bay is a classic example, are these coastal water bodies where rivers meet the ocean and they're some of the most productive places on earth. Uh, what Don was talking about is estuaries, including the Chesapeake, aren't even here 90% of geologic time. Most of the time, the water is all tied up in the glaciers, ice ages. Only in these rather brief ephemeral interglacials do the oceans rise out of their basins, crawl across the continental shelves, and swell into nooks and crannies of the coastline to form Chesapeake Bay? Most of the time, it's not here. Uh, Pritchard said we should enjoy it. We are in our interglacial called the Holocene. Uh, some ecologists want to call it the Anthropocene because it's the interglacial where humans are having influence big time over nature. The, the people who make the final call on that, the uh, geology boys, they're, they're, they're going to wait a few thousand years to declare it a different, uh, you know, they, they, the hard rock guys want to see more evidence than, uh, than a little polluted water to call it the Anthropocene. So the Holocene, but it is a particularly nice and long and stable one. And when you think about it, um, you really can't have the development of a large and complex civilization in an era of climate instability. And that's something we really need to keep in mind with climate change. Sea level rise, which we worry about a lot now, made the bay. Without the glaciers melting and the sea level rising from 20,000 years ago to about 3,000 years ago, there would be no Chesapeake Bay. In that 3,000 years, uh, the seas have been pretty stable, not just here, but worldwide. In that time, human populations have grown from millions to tens of millions to several orders of magnitude to seven and a half billion headed toward nine or ten. And now, all of a sudden, we may see the end of that era of stability. Uh, uh, so it's also interesting that I mentioned humans like waterfront. Of those seven and a half million people on Earth, about half of us live pretty close to an edge of land and water. So when the sea starts to become less stable, that's a big, big deal. So we live in an age of estuaries. Much more recently, as of around here, maybe the 1950s and 60s, we've entered another age unprecedented, the age of eutrophic estuaries, estuaries that have become fat, to put it in human terms, over-fertilized with nitrogen and phosphorus from human activities, from wastes to fossil fuel burning. I'll, I'll go into that a little bit later. Uh, this age is not unique to the Bay, this age of eutrophy. Uh, it's happening to coastal waters from Hong Kong Harbor to the Baltic to San Francisco Bay to the Gulf of Mexico. And essentially what's happening is growing populations discharge more wastes, more intensive agriculture to feed those growing populations, leaks fertilizers, the increased burning of fossil fuels to heat and cool and transport those growing populations, yada, yada. And the bay becomes over-fertilized, uh, probably about seven times the amount of nutrients that the bay evolved to handle. Uh, we can't go back to one-seventh, but we think if we can go back to about half what we're putting in the bay now, that would make it as good as it was when I was a kid, and that was a pretty good, pretty good bay. Uh, 
what happens is too much fertilizer grows too much plant life, floating algae. The floating algae cuts the light going to critters that live on the bay's bottom, and we've seen a massive decrease in everything from oysters to submerged aquatic vegetation, all of it critical habitat for a healthy bay. Worse than that, when the algae decomposes, it sucks the oxygen out of the deeper waters, creating what we call dead zones. And there are about 450 documented around the world. The bay is one of the, the better studied. So then we enter, you got the age of estuaries, the age of fat, eutrophic estuaries. Uh, more recently, since the mid to late 80s, we've entered the age on the Chesapeake of trying to restore eutrophic estuaries to something like we knew them at least in the 1950s. And the bay is sort of in the forefront of that. Uh, it happened after several years of scientific inquiry into whether we were just seeing natural up and down cycles or something that was new. And we concluded in the late 70s it was something new and it would take about a 50% reduction in the pollution we're causing to bring things back to normal. So how's that all been going? Uh, I, I can count on one hand the insights I've had. I gave you one. I'm going to give you maybe the only other I've had. I, I'm not given to great insights. But at some point fairly early in my career covering environment for the Baltimore Sun, I had some other good job offers. And I didn't take them, and I turned down some others because I realized if you liked writing about nature, if you liked covering the environmental story, big and small, uh, we were running as good an experiment, macro cosmic scale experiment here on the Chesapeake as you could ever wish for. We had a world class resource, acre for acre, estuaries like the bay, when they're perking along, hitting on all their cylinders, they're, they're more productive than almost any other parts of the planetary environment. Uh, we had screwed up this world-class resource in a world-class way to the point that sometime shortly after Earth Day, the first one was 1970, somewhere in the early 70s, the Chesapeake ecosystem literally flipped upside down. Uh, it made a dramatic change from a, a place where the bulk of the life and the productivity was on the bottom when the water was still clear to something that shifted to the top, floating algae and critters like menhaden that could uh, capitalize on it, like crabs that could stand it. Uh, it's a pretty amazing thing to take an ecosystem the size of the Chesapeake and turn it upside down, probably a little bit like what we did when we started to break the sod of the tall grass prairies to grow wheat. And, you know, we didn't just turn an ecosystem upside down. We turned a culture that was based on buffalo and free range into agriculture and fences and cattle instead of buffalo. So it was a pretty big thing we did. And then, to make the experiment more interesting, we started, if not a world class, the world's most comprehensive attempt to reverse this. Even as we continue to increase population, about a million and a half a decade in that watershed. Since I was a boy, uh, the population of the Bay watershed's gone from about 8 million to about 18, 17 million, 17 and a half million. Uh, so can we do this? This is pretty fun to cover. And that's what I've been doing with the rest of my life. There's really, you can break it down to three aspects. Uh, you gotta cover pollution. That's all the crap we put in the Bay. You also got to cover all the stuff we take out, harvests, because if you're taking fish and crabs and oysters out faster than they can reproduce, your water quality could be perfect and it still wouldn't matter. So what you put in, what you take out. The final one, and I'll explain it a little more later, is resilience. That goes back to that giant landscape. Uh, protecting all those systems on the land like forests and wetlands that produce very little pollution, that if we just leave them be, help the bay help itself, they filter and buffer it against polluted runoff, against dirty air, 
Uh, some of the systems of resilience lie in the bay itself, oysters, which clean and clarify and filter the water. So how are we doing on those three areas? Uh, I'll just give you a thumbnail sketch with pollution, the stuff we put in the bay. We have employed tried and true technology, uh, good funding sources uh, built into the Clean Water Act to carry the bay restoration on the back of better sewage treatment. And how good can that be? The Patuxent River, which was where we first started to notice things going wrong in the 1960s. Since the 1950s on the Patuxent River, which drains a lot of central Maryland, the DC suburbs, population has increased from 30,000 to 1.2 million, a 40-fold increase in population. And we have actually reduced the pollution in that river from sewage, just through pure technology and billions of dollars and laws. They can take your firstborn child if you don't pay your water and sewer bill. So sewage, we know sewage works. And I would never have thought we could achieve that. The caveat to that is our sewage treatment plants around the Bay are running pretty close to the limits of technology, pretty close to the limits. You know, once you take 90 some percent of the pollution out, getting that remaining bit, one, you don't get that much, there's not that much left, and it costs a lot. Uh, so the bottom line is sewage has carried us to a large extent. The modest improvements we've seen have been largely due to better sewage treatment. It's not going to carry us for the next several decades, uh, a little bit. Uh, the Clean Air Act. Uh, that too has, has had a real significant effect. Uh, it's a tough law. It's not really designed for estuaries. It's designed to protect human health, but in protecting human health, making cars cleaner, smokestacks cleaner, uh, burning cleaner fuels, going to renewables, we have, uh, uh, you know, cranked down a good bit on that. So again, a technological solution. Uh, we kind of like those because they don't make us change our lifestyle much. They're good for the economy. You create probably more jobs than you lose from cranking down on sources of pollution from pipes and smokestacks. Uh, where we have not done well, and it's going to be the struggle for the next several decades, is I wish there was a better term. We call them non-point sources, diffuse sources. All of the rainfall, the water carried off uh, through overland flow or through groundwater from agriculture. Agriculture is the biggest pollutant of the Bay. When I say that to farm groups, they all think I hate them. I try to tell them, look, you're the biggest human land use in the Bay. That 64,000 square mile watershed Agriculture is about 40% of it. How could you not be a large source of pollution? It's not that an individual farm is so bad, but 40% of the watershed. I would have to say that uh, probably a close second to dealing with climate change is figuring out how in the hell we're going to feed 8 to 10 billion people without screwing up water quality. Uh, except for some rather small examples, no one's really figured that out. The current systems of modern agriculture we use, very meat intensive as part of it, uh, even if a farmer does the best job he can, put a lot of stuff in the bay. And there are some things we can do, some things we're doing, but uh, it, it is, uh, well, I'll give you an example. The Patuxent River, for all of the good work it did with sewage, uh, literally decoupling pollution from sewage from 1.2 million people, uh, it gets a D minus on Bay report cards. Why? Because we didn't deal with the pollution coming off the landscape. We focused on the pipes and we needed to. That was a good thing. But if you get a rainy year, it overwhelms everything we've done because we haven't done a good job with the landscape. So that's kind of the thumbnail sketch of how we're doing on pollution. Uh, could be worse, could be better. Harvests, uh, two successes stand out, uh, rockfish and crabs. 
And mm -hmm. I'm gonna play you, if how am I doing on time, Patricia? Eight minutes, okay, I'm not gonna show that film clip, I'm gonna, okay, it's just a minute or two, uh, and then I'll explain it. Let me see if I can do it. This is from a movie we made called Beautiful Swimmers Revisited. It's an hour long film. Uh, you can stream it off this website free. It's following up 40 years later on William Warner's 1976 Pulitzer Prize winner on crabbing the Chesapeake. Wonderful book. And there's just one clip I want to show you. Weighs approximately 110 grams, almost identical to the previous crab. And it's the only survey we have uh, until very recent years that covered the entire Chesapeake Bay. On this mid-January day, the research vessel Bay Eagle and its crew from the Virginia Institute of Marine Science, or VIMS, is counting blue crabs buried in the mud to predict how many will be available if to harvest next like summer. This, then we should have a pretty good year in terms of the dread survey. Captain John Olney, Jr. drags the bottom for precisely 60 seconds at each station, just as his Maryland counterpart does in the upper Chesapeake. Men and women of science on their hands and knees in oil skins on a cold, wet, and wind-whipped boat deck paw through clumps of mud, shell, and detritus dredged from the bay bottom. They are divining the future making sense of a mysterious world, an age-old quest that stretches from magic to science, from shamans poking at the entrails of sacrifices to biologists sifting the guts of the bay for blue crabs down to the size of a fingernail clipping. So uh, that's an hour long film and there's a lot of cool stuff in it, but the reason I made that film is that little segment right there. The hero of that film is a 25-year random statistical sampling survey of crabs undertaken by some very wise scientists before crabs actually started to decline from overfishing. Uh, it, it allowed us to count crabs. You can't manage anything from your bank account to the bay if you can't count what's out there. And Without those long-term surveys, so you can't do it. Anyway, uh, uh, so this survey is the reason that, I don't know where that's coming from. Is that controllable? Or? Okay, uh, that survey, which isn't very sexy, is the reason in 2008, Tim Kaine and Martin O'Malley, the two governors of Virginia and Maryland, had the political backbone, the legal backing, to stand on the beach of the Potomac River and put some very politically tough restrictions on crabs. Without that survey, they could not have done it, or they would have been sued and lost in court. The same thing happened in 1985 when the late Governor Harry Hughes, he just died, took probably a more controversial decision to put a moratorium on all fishing for the state's premier sport and commercial fish, the striped bass. Again, Harry was backed by 20 years of monitoring of surveys that gave him the political backbone and the legal backing. I guess my point is if you look at our success in managing the bay, where we have done the science and followed it and let it guide us in setting tough, enforceable deadlines, rules, where we have done federal, state, or bi-state cooperation, oversight, all of these things that everybody hates to do and no one campaigns for office saying I'm going to be the candidate of regulation and enforcement. They just don't. Uh, where we've done that with the rockfish and the crab, we've won. We've done pretty well. It's not things are perfect. Uh, I don't think you can repeat those lessons enough, especially 
uh, estuaries, without getting too much into the weeds, are particularly dynamic bodies of water because oceans hitting rivers, wet years, dry years, it's shallow, so the temperature can flip quickly. Of, of all the places on Earth, you need long-term monitoring because there's a lot of noise in there, you know, a lot of natural ups and downs from week to week, wet year to dry, uh, hot year to cold. Uh, that kind of monitoring, that's the first thing people cut. It would be like tree planting on campus. If you had to cut the budget, who's going to know if you don't plant the next generation of trees till after you're out of here, you know? So it's easy to cut. Okay, we got to get. So uh, where we've done that, where we haven't done it with oysters, with shad, with menhaden, we're losing. We're not doing well. Uh, resilience, again. Uh, this goes back to the capacity of that big watershed to help the bay help itself. Uh, the more we can keep the watershed like it was before John Smith's time when seven or eight million beavers roamed and ponded and dammed every stream and created millions of wetlands and held back the pollution and the sediments, that's uh, Walter Boynton, the top bay scientist, wants to load up every FedEx and UPS truck on Sunday night with beavers and distribute them all over the watershed. And, and Walter's plan is idiotic, but it makes a lot of sense. Uh, a greener, wetter landscape always results in cleaner water. And we have a number of projects like planting forests along the edges of land and water, uh, working toward no net loss of the forests we've got left, protecting wetlands. Progress on all of these ranges from way too slow to not quite enough, but making a little progress. Also, the resilience that lies in the water, oysters, we are beginning to create sanctuaries. The legislature just overrode the governor's veto to expand the oyster sanctuary. So, we are working on resilience. Uh, it's, it's a long way to go because there are so many other pressures that result in clearing and paving and developing the landscape, especially as more and more people move in. So uh, just to wrap up, uh, you know, I, I started teaching a class at Salisbury University on the Bay 10 years ago. In the last couple years, I have told my classes for the first time in, in several years, I can tell them that we are showing significant uh, measurable signs of progress, by no means home free. We still have a long way to go with agriculture. We have an even longer way to go with the state of Pennsylvania, which is about 38%, 40% of the watershed. Think about it, you're the governor of Pennsylvania. All your votes are over in Philly, in the Delaware River drainage over in Pittsburgh, which drains to the Mississippi. It's mostly cows and Republicans, the governor's a Democrat, in between. And that's, that's where you're expected to spend billions and billions of dollars. This is why to clean up a six state watershed, six state and the District of Columbia, like the Bay, you have to have a strong EPA. Uh, I don't need to dwell on why EPA is not doing so good right now. Uh, we do not have a strong EPA and we won't until we get a stronger EPA, I guess. Uh, so, uh, you know, that doesn't mean there's nothing you can do. And meanwhile, climate change. Good news about climate change is because so much of what we need to do to fight climate change involves switching from the burning of fossil fuels, there are huge overlaps with the Bay. A lot of what you do to combat climate change also will reduce the dirty air and other sources that are polluting the Chesapeake. It's not anywhere near 100% overlap, but there are considerable overlaps. You could, you could deny climate change and love the Chesapeake and actually endorse a lot of things that would help with climate change. It's that much of an overlap. So I guess the, the, the lessons I've covered or follow the science Voluntary doesn't work. The whole Bay cleanup from 87 to 2010 was voluntary. Uh, we knew, I kind of said it was a polite fiction in that book in 2003. Even EPA acknowledged that in 2010. We've gone to a more regulatory approach and the screaming is still 
not subsided, but it's a good move. Uh, we can't do it all in a voluntary way. Uh, bigger picture things, I usually end up my Chesapeake Bay class the last few weeks talking about things like diet, uh, population, energy, things that go well beyond the scope of the Chesapeake cleanup, but things that if we do not attend to will eventually offset or undercut a lot of the things the Chesapeake Bay cleanup is about. Uh, if you want to make a big reduction in nitrogen, change your diet from lots of red meat, better yet, to not so much meat. Uh, a Mediterranean diet, which is hardly meatless, very healthy diet endorsed by many nutritionists, would probably, if we all did it, cut uh, a major bay pollutant nitrogen fertilizer by 40%. That's about what we need to do. So diet is a huge thing that an individual has control over. Uh, plant trees, trees are the answer, my tree forester friend says. He's a commercial logger, but he's right. Uh, you can't find a place with a lot of trees next to the water where the water isn't in pretty good shape. Uh, and if it's just in your yard, I have a tenth of an acre yard. I have given away my lawnmower and weed whacker. There is no grass left. It's all trees. You can hardly see my house. My daughter says, hey, you don't need to paint it. It's invisible now. So, you know, and I don't use nearly as much air conditioning. So diet and trees. Uh, Population, that is the one thing that uh, it's become a taboo. We talked about population a lot in the 60s. Uh, environmental groups, almost universally, including the ones I love, like the Bay Foundation, work solely on one side of the equation, the per capita footprint. They will tell you to do lots of things, like I'm telling you, to reduce your per capita impact. That is important. You would have to do that if population were stable or even declining. But to ignore how many people are moving in, and this is not an easy answer, but when people ask me what my answer is, I say, how would I know? We don't even discuss it. How, how could I have the answer? No one wants to talk about it, and I find it very frustrating. So uh, One other thing, I have read some pretty interesting critiques of modern environmentalism that suggest that uh, it has cast its net too narrowly, too focused on nitrogen, phosphorus, clean air, clean water, that to be really successful, environmentalists probably need to move toward more of a green politics. You can argue that getting the money out of politics in this country would help the environment more than everything the Sierra Club and the Bay Foundation can achieve in a narrower focus in the next 20 years. So uh, I, I think there's some truth to that. So that's, thank you for listening. And uh, I. Yeah, please don't think that if I didn't mention something, you can't ask me about it, because there's a lot I didn't mention. Hi, Tom. Uh, sea level rise seems inevitable based upon climate change. And so do you feel that um, we should really work to ameliorate uh, sea level rise around the bay? Or should we just write off places like half of Dorchester County and Smith Island and not spend the money? You know, it's, it's a good question because, yeah, the projections are that sea level will rise three and a half to five and a half feet by the end of this century. Uh, it could well be more. But uh, for Dorchester County, five feet would flood half of Maryland's biggest county. Uh, that's pretty dramatic, and we actually made a movie on that. You know, uh, there's the run of the century, that's one thing. I, I would say that the islands and the low-lying parts of the bay are toast by 2100. But that's a long time. Uh, I'd also say I would vote for spending maybe 20, 30 million to put more erosion controls around unique places like Tangier Island, because I think that could buy them, even with sea level rise, another generation or two. Uh, or the next big storm could make me look like a fool for saying that. You don't know. 
and I think that nuance is lost sometimes. People sitting in Washington say, well, they're not only gone by 2100, they vote for Trump, so screw them. Uh, I mean, I get that a lot, even some of my students. Uh, I, I would say it's a little more complex, and yeah, if we can, uh, Maryland has actually put about $20 million of rock around Smith Island, a unique little fishing community uh, that also votes for Trump and doesn't say things that are politically correct all the time, but is still worth preserving. In my, uh, I lived there for three years. I'm kind of biased. I love them. But uh, uh, so I think it's, it's a complicated answer. But the fact is we are going to lose there's not a county that borders the bay in Maryland or Virginia that isn't going to lose ground and have to deal with the question of property devaluation, human lives at risk uh, from sea level rise. And we're going to lose tens of thousands of acres of wetlands. Uh, and we're trying to put a good face on it. As forests are submerged, they may turn into new wetlands. Uh, it's an imperfect process. I think net loss, we're going to lose, the bay, lose a lot of the bay's wetlands, which are some of the bay's best habitat. But uh, if we don't get a handle on sea level rise, uh, you know, pretty soon, well, climate change. And it's not just sea level rise. The bay is about four degrees Fahrenheit warmer, as measured off the dock at the University of Maryland lab at Solomon since the 1930s. The projections are a bay in 2100, the temperature of South Florida right now. That's a very different ecosystem. And like I say, everything I'm telling you with a South Florida Bay water temperature in 2100, it's going to be a different place. So we are really looking at a, a, a shifting scale and shifting faster than we're used to. It might question. actually be better for crabs. They do fine down in the Gulf of Mexico and Florida. We might end up crabbing year-round. You'll have crab cakes fresh every day. I don't know. Other questions? If you don't ask, I'll ask one. Yeah. Um, could you talk a little bit about the cooperation or lack of cooperation among the states around the Bay? I know there have been times when I've heard a lot about this and other times when I've heard virtually nothing about this. Yeah. So could you talk a little bit more about that? Well, of course, the, the, the Bay Restoration Program by design uh, involves EPA, the federal government, and representatives from Maryland, Virginia, West Virginia, uh, Pennsylvania, Delaware, and the District of Columbia. <laughs> I remember in 83 here in Marion Barry, the mayor of D.C. giving a speech about the rockfish, which I believe had been written for him. I'm not sure he had ever uttered the word rockfish before, but he gave a good delivery, you know? It was kind of cool to see. <laughs> was it really? Well, he, he may have known more about it than I thought, yeah. So, uh, you know, we, we include them all. Uh, I mentioned politically Pennsylvania. If, if we were one state, Maryland and Virginia would be spending more money upstream in what is called Pennsylvania now. That's a hard thing to do when you are a state to spend scarce tax dollars in another state. It would actually make more sense for us to put some of our pollution money up in Pennsylvania. The feds can, can funnel money somewhat that way. So if you just had a state of Chesapeake, it's clear we would manage it differently and probably more efficiently. Uh, you know, some of the states, West Virginia is not real thrilled about cleaning up the bay. Uh, I, won't, I won't say it doesn't matter what West Virginia does. It does, but it's, that, that's not going to make it or break it, you know. And, and they do do some things, but uh, I, I guess, does that get at your question somewhat, or have I? Yeah, okay. Yes, sir. It, it is a big industry, and places like 
on the eastern shore depend on it. And of course, the ocean coasts are massive tourism, and they are not technically in the bay drainage, but they're they're vulnerable to climate change and sea level rise. You know, tourism huge now. You know, I I was tempted to talk about the economy in a different way because. I've talked about population growth enough to know that you can't separate it from the modern economy, which says you're either growing or you're dying. Uh, and you know, we know we can't grow forever, but we have an economy right now that's highly dependent on consumption, that is a growing population to grow. And as long as we say it's grow or die, and we essentially say that at every level of government, both Republicans and Democrats, uh, we lock ourselves into a system that's going to be very hard to, to uh, you know, make it work sustainably. In fact, virtually impossible in the long run. That's a, that, that gets into a whole other discussion of, of steady state economics and economics as if nature mattered. Uh, just a quick example. For Rolling Stone, I spent four months in Alaska covering what was then the biggest oil spill in history. That year, the nation's gross domestic product, our broadest uh, measure of economic progress, leaped upward because of the billions and billions Exxon was spending cleaning up the oil spill. It shouldn't have leaped up like that, but we don't count the dead otters and the lack of spawning and fish for the next 10 years. We don't even measure those things. We, we, our accounting for progress is pretty selective. Uh, you get a divorce, it counts the money you spend on lawyers. We don't count the wreckage of family and children that may need counseling or not be as productive. It's a, uh, what, you, you, you save what you value, and our current economic reckoning does not value nature nearly as much as it should, and it certainly does not count the loss of nature when we pave or build. It counts the money we put into the construction industry. So that's, that's a whole nother tangent. But uh, yeah, tourism is a, you know, if, if the bay is polluted, I, I got to say, I, I went to a hearing a long time ago, and a realtor got up, and she was very heartfelt. And she said, no one wants a cleaner bay more than the real estate industry, because we want lots of people to keep moving here. And I, I OK, good luck. Uh, you know? Well, partly I, I, I think you tend to have a lot of people focused on the Bay and environment, uh, my generation and a little older and a little younger, partly because we've got time to. I can't tell you how many books in places like Talbot County I've signed for CEOs retired from companies that probably didn't have shining records environmentally, and now that they're retired and living on the Bay, they're very interested, and they're giving money to it, so what the hell. So yes, I think I think we, you know, most of the people in this room, but you know, then there's people like Sarah Hansen who I'm I'm really glad to see you here because she's she's got the potential to do the kind of stuff I've been doing, you know, uh, communicating science and stuff, and uh, gives me a lot of uh, pleasure and hope to see people like you show up at things like this. Uh, so, uh, but. Yeah, you know, when you're raising a family, uh, worrying about the next step in your career, you, you don't focus as much. And I think if you look at the average age of the Bay Foundations and the Nature Conservancy's membership, it's shockingly old. Uh, probably 60s, maybe even late 60s. That, that's not a good sign. Uh, and of course, they're aware of that and working on it. But uh, Maryland has passed something, though, that's I think it's still the only one in the nation. We now have an environmental literacy law that requires every school system to incorporate environment from pre-K right on up to 12th grade. That's not something that gives you a bang short term, but long term. And some counties are running with it, others are hoping it goes away. 
uh, I won't name names, but many of the ones hoping it goes away are over on my side of the bay. But anyway, it's uh, that that's that's good because uh, you know people in this room are not going to carry it forever. Thank you. Let's uh, give him a hand and appreciate. We don't want you to go away either. So if some of you have questions that you didn't get to ask, I think he'll be here for a while. And really grateful, Tom. We're now going to turn to Lynn Schaefer. <laughs> and Lynn uh, is the Vice President for Administration and Finance on campus right now. And she's going to talk a little bit about some of the environmental uh, initiatives that are ongoing here at UMBC that were referenced by Dr. Rabowski. And um, he mentioned Sarah Hansen. Next to Sarah Hansen is Larry Hennessy. Uh, they are not retired. They <laughs> but we invited them as guests because they are both very involved and active with some of the things that I'm sure you're going to talk about, Lynn. Thank you, Patricia. Nice to see you. Uh, nice to see all of you. Thank you so much. And, and I really appreciate the opportunity to talk to you a little bit about what's been happening on campus. Uh, we signed the Lynn, how many years have you been here? 14 years. You came from where? From Michigan, from Oakland University, Wayne State University. Yeah. But I've made Maryland, especially UMBC, my home. Uh, so 12 years ago, uh, the president signed the American College and University President's Climate Commission Commitment, or what we finally call the ACUPCC. Anyways, that was a commitment signed now by over 900 university presidents across the country to use universities as a lab to demonstrate what can be done for the environment to combat climate change, to educate the next generation, to do the research necessary to keep getting us to the next level of being able to manage the things that Tom was talking about. And so I wanted to just talk a little bit about what we've done in the past 12 years with that commitment. So since 2007, when we signed it, we have increased enrollment by 18%. We've increased the building square footage by 19%. And we have reduced our greenhouse gas emissions by 20%. So pretty Round substantial. Applause, yeah. So uh, I don't know if it'll surprise you to know that 40% of our carbon footprint is electricity usage. And so we have reduced our electricity usage over this period by 12 million kilowatt hours. That's a 15% reduction. Plus, we now purchase 33% of our electricity through renewable sources. And some of them direct investment in the Conowingo Dam and uh, some wind farms in Maryland. So we've invested $12 million in energy efficiency upgrades in lighting, in our HVAC, uh, and through performance contracts where we borrow money to do the work and we're going to pay them back over 10 years with the savings. And those are going great. We actually are achieving more savings than we expected and that's providing us a boon to do some of the other things I'm going to talk about. So we have now five living green roofs on campus. They are in the Patapsco Hall Edition, the Administration Building, the Apartment Community Center, the Event Center, Yes, there's one here somewhere on this, this building and in the new Interdisciplinary Life Sciences building that's opening up this summer. And those, those basically give us a way to filter uh, rainwater and to cool the buildings um, by having that feature on the buildings. We have a we've been redesigning our campus landscape so that it will clean the water and support wildlife. So things like stormwater retention, uh, bay, bay protective landscaping, natural species, um, pervious pavers in various places, no mow zones uh, on our campus, and we have a student-built community garden and a food forest and pollinator gardens. 
I've learned so much in this job. <laughs> Uh, in, 19, in 2019, the National Wildlife Federation named UMBC as a wildlife habitat. Mm -hmm. Round of applause, yep. And I'm glad Larry Hennessy is here because Larry's been working with the Student Environmental Task Force for a number of years to eliminate invasive species and do cleanup across campus. And they've been awarded a 2019 Keep, Amer Keep Maryland Beautiful grant to plant native shrubs and understory trees. Thank you for that work, Larry. So 20% of our carbon footprint is commuting by students. We have another 7% commuting by faculty and staff. And so that's a big nut to crack and we all love our single vehicles, and so trying to change behaviors, especially on our students' part, because they have uh, maybe a better ability and motivation to do that, has been a challenge. But we've done things like expanding our public transit fleet and using biodiesel, buses and shuttles, having a ride share program so that people in the same area can find each other and hopefully carpool. We have a carpooling program where we give priority parking to people who carpool, can prove they've carpooled, and get here before 10.30 in the morning. Uh, we have zip cars, we have electric vehicle charging stations, and we have instituted a bike share program. We still have a single occupant vehicle problem on our campus, but we're going to continue to work on that one. Our recycling program has now gone to single stream which is great. We continue, I, some of you, uh, when you were actively on campus, might have remembered Recycle Mania. It's something that comes around every March, and we were very proud that we always placed very well and got rid of a ton, tons and tons of uh, recycling during that period. Well, now our focus is more on reducing waste to start with, and so being more sustainable in our practices. Uh, we've established composting, in True Grits and in the Commons, um, and that's that's been really very popular with students. And still, recycling or waste, I'll say solid waste, is less than, I think it's like two-tenths of a percent, right? It's two-tenths of a percent of our carbon footprint. So we always think of recycling maybe as the threshold practice, get people interested in that and changing their behavior, realizing that it's doable, and then hopefully they'll continue to do it. Uh, we have a number of ways to engage the campus community. For students, we have eco-ambassadors who go out peer-to-peer -peer teaching their fellow students about sustainable practices and getting them engaged in projects on campus, including planting trees, which we do plenty of every year. For the faculty, we had uh, an annual workshop on sustainability across the disciplines for a number of years. That then morphed into a faculty learning community under the Faculty Development Center, and they have a number of initiatives that they're working on implementing right now. For staff, we have a green office program. We have now more than 40 offices on campus certified as green offices, and that includes all kinds of practices that are pretty simple to do. You know, I got rid of the printer in my office, and so I rarely print anything two-sided printing, hibernation of your computer, turning off lights, really simple things, but again, getting people into the habit of changing their behavior. Uh, our dining services contract calls for 25% of food from local, sustainable, and ethical sources. And the dining hall now contains a hydroponic garden to grow greens and other kinds of vegetables. It, the, uh, dining hall is also trayless, strawless, and has a re reusable container system so that we get rid of styrofoam and other kinds of things that are really damaging to the environment. We have goals. One of them is rewriting the climate action plan for the university. The first one was written in 2009, and it called for carbon neutrality by 2075. Okay, we all recognize that's way too far out into the future and so, but at the time we just couldn't see our way clear other than just buying a whole bunch more renewable energy credits to get to that. 
now there's a lot more knowledge of what kinds of things might work. And so we're planning on significantly pulling up that time frame for becoming carbon neutral on campus. We are finally establishing a formal sustainability office on campus and in the process of hiring an associate director to lead that effort to just pull together all the things that are happening across campus and hopefully take us to the next level. We're going to continue to search out business improvements to reduce our impact. One is a, a new program called DocuSign. It's a new app that does, ever, does signatures and workflow online so that we're not carrying paper all around campus to uh, get signatures. Um, and we're always, we're going to try to lead by example, try to engage more of the campus community. Hopefully, any of you who have ideas or any kind of passion about this will join our efforts and get us to carbon neutrality sooner. I'd be happy to answer any questions or uh, we're going to send this to you, by the way, electronically, my list of things. Oh. I have just a comment. Mm -hmm. uh, once you achieve carbon neutrality, mm -hmm. something else to work on? Yes. Just in the last few years, It is. Mm -hmm. uh, all sorts of overlap with mm -hmm. carbon, but I, I'm beginning to use that more with my students, and it's, it's pretty good. And I know that our grounds folks really care about the kinds of things they're putting on our landscaping features. First of all, limiting the amount of features that we have to manage with any kind of treatments, and then using uh, treatments that are less damaging to the bay. But we'll look at, look at that. And it. Okay, good. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank yeah. you. I appreciate that. Just a comment. Lynn Schaefer is the current chair of the CUBO board. That's the National Association of All CFOs of universities in the country. Give a round of applause for her leadership. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And Lynn, we thank you. Thank you for updating us about the green efforts on campus, um, as well as your heroic efforts to make sure that UMBC is always oriented to sustainability. You really have made a difference. I was listening to that list, and I hope you felt as I did. I sat there again and again going, wow, this is great. I am so proud. I am so proud. We shall. And in fact, as, as, as Lynn noted, we are indeed going to make sure that everyone receives an email of that list, and we will make sure it's on our website. We are really, really proud. I, I, had, I had goosebumps during both presentations, thinking about work that has been done, and then got gray hairs yet again, thinking about the work that's left to do. <laughs> um, but truly, Lynn, under your leadership, uh, UMBC has adopted the message, and I think even more importantly, the actions associated with the tagline, Sustainability Matters. That's fantastic. Again, I, I, I get goosebumps over things like this, Dr. Lebowski. Um, not math problems, I have to be honest. But UMBC has really become a beautiful campus, and we, we noted be earlier in the day, infused with flowers and shrubs and trees, Although, Tom, I guess we have more work to do because we can still see our buildings. No, you know, I, I too recall coming here many years ago and thinking they need some trees out here. It's a big, big, big difference now. Yeah. It's a big, big difference now. So we are grateful and we are proud. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Lynn. Um, and now it's time for dessert, which is going to be fun. There's coffee, tea, and drinks at a side table. Please feel free to get up and move around. Just one comment, I, I could. I, I want to make sure, if you see your legislator or the governor, I want you to thank them. We're getting more money to UMBC, singled out for UMBC, than I have seen in my 40 years in Maryland. It's, it, it is amazing. So I want to give the governor, you have to give credit when credit is due. And with the governor, so you really did do that. Anyway.
the workforce solutions, millions and millions of more dollars and the legislature. So when you see people, thank them for supporting UMBC. As you finish dessert and perhaps sip on um, coffee and, and begin these wonderful free uh, conversations, I apologize for this interlude, but a few more comments and uh, to say as we, we close the, the formal part of, of our day together. I think this has been an exciting and a thoughtful and Tom and Lynn thought-provoking day as well. I think you feel as I do, it's always special to come to campus and it's especially, especially meaningful to see friends and colleagues with whom we worked together so many years. Um, I find sheer unadulterated joy just looking um, at persons being together. On behalf of everyone here, I would like to express my deep appreciation again to Tom Horton. I appreciate your message, Tom, as well as some of the images you created for me. I have to be honest, I'm not a visualizer, but as you spoke, I found myself trying to envision the ocean literally crawling across continents and filling nooks and crannies. And I sat there and I thought, gads, nooks and crannies, for me, that was always a phrase dedicated to English muffins. Um, <laughs> never again, <laughs> just English muffins. I also had never tried to visualize a whole ecosystem like the Chesapeake Bay turning upside down. Uh, what an incredible thought, what an incredible vision. Um, equally, um, and perhaps even more difficult for me, but more fun, was trying to envision hundreds of beavers being delivered <laughs> by FedEx, <laughs> um, anxious to build dams and save the bay. It's no wonder to me, Tom, that your voice has been pivotal in local and state efforts to save and restore the Bay. Thank you not only for sharing your insights today, but for being an advocate for the Bay for so many years. Uh, you have always been a force in building environmental awareness, and at the same time, you challenge us to do all that we can to preserve and protect the natural environment. I say thank you again to Lynn Schaefer, the campus looks terrific, and it is thrilling to hear that we are doing so many things that are right, that are meaningful, and that are making a difference. Um, sustainability matters at UMBC, and I'm proud and grateful for that, and I know that you are too. Dr. Bowski has left, but I want to again just acknowledge uh, his support and that of Dr. Philip Rouse. Uh, without their vision and their commitment to ensure that we will always be part of the UMBC community, indeed part of the engaged UMBC family, the Wisdom Institute would truly never exist. They are benefactors to all that we do. And I want to thank again the Wisdom Institute board and especially the programming committee. They have planned so many fabulous events and as you saw on the PowerPoint, we have even more up and coming. Um, we, we're going to have breakfast at ERCAD. I hope you will join us and then go and listen to our students. Uh, so 9 o'clock in the UC, room 321. Uh, breakfast, informal gathering, and then we can go meet and greet and listen and learn from our students. Uh, Brian McKay is going to be leading a trip to the National Arboretum on May 1st. And I think that's going to be a lot of fun. And remember, we always have informal um, luncheons at the Skylight. Please look at the website. Uh, you'll see all of the things that are, that are going on. And if you're not receiving information from us and want to, please make sure to fill out the form on the website, get it back to us, and we'll see that you get all the information that you need. Clearly, our individual and collective efforts can make a difference in preserving the Bay and its abundant resources. Our efforts can also advance and protect the natural spaces at UMBC. I think the message today is that there's still more work for us to do. Um, and I think our response is that we are indeed ready to do it. We want to thank each of you for coming, coming out on a day that turns out to have a little bit of rain, which we know is good, <laughs> um, good for the environment. We hope you'll attend other Wisdom Institute events throughout the year and engage in service opportunities. We wish we could send everyone home with flowers. Um, but the person with a sticker on the back of her or his chair is invited to take the flowers on the table and enjoy them at home. We will be able, however, to send everyone home with a Wisdom Institute tote bag. Thanks to the suggestion of Dr. Willie Lemuse-Smith, 
and we want you to take this tote bag with you and refuse a plastic bag when shopping. Um, they'll be given to you as you leave. And again, let me say it was lovely to be back home. In closing, let me uh, quote a question posed by the late poet Mary Oliver. This question seemed especially important and appropriate today. Oliver invites us to reflect. Tell me, she says, tell me what it is you plan to do with your one and precious wild life. Thank you all for coming and enjoy the remainder of the day. Please stay and chat, grab some more to drink, enjoy dessert, and look at what we're going to do next year and put it on your calendar and come back. Thank you all.